Okay, I think we'll get started now. Um, welcome everyone to our special Friends of Lick Observatory um, virtual observing session. Um, it's a great weather night here at Lick Observatory, so I hope we'll have a lot of fun and this will be really informative. Uh, this is the first time we are doing a program like this. So uh, if it's successful, we may do more of these in the future. Um, and anyway, um, just to let you know that we are recording this program and it will be um, posted on our the UC Observatory's YouTube site. So I will put that in the chat uh, when I get a moment so that you can all look it up in case you can't stay for the whole evening. Um, just know that, that you'll have a chance to see it on YouTube. Uh, we hope to get it posted early next week. Um, anyway. Let me introduce myself. I'm Eleanor Gates, or Ellie Gates. Uh, I am one of the resident staff astronomers here at Lick Observatory. Um, also helping us this evening is Paul Lynham, another one of our staff astronomers. Hello, everybody. Hello. And, um, and our telescope operator tonight is our third uh, resident astronomer, uh, John Reese. Uh, John came to us uh, just this past year. He's been here at Lick Observatory just over a year. So he's had a rather unique experience learning about Lick Observatory during the pandemic and not being able to go into the buildings uh, because of COVID and yet having to learn all our equipment and uh, software. But he comes to us uh, most recently from uh, New Mexico where he worked with the Apache Peak Observatory and uh, New Mexico State University. Uh, before that, he was a postdoc in the University of California system, and he got his PhD from the University of Exeter in the UK. Um, so we're very pleased to have him on staff, and for many of you, this will be the first time um, you'll see his name on anything because he is new to the observatory. Um, anyway, the plan this evening is that um, you will get to see how we set up the telescope and do calibrations as if we were going to be taking scientific data tonight. And then about nine o'clock-ish, we will be transitioning to, um, you know, taking pictures through the telescope. And, uh, and we'll also have opportunities periodically throughout this evening to um, ask questions. So if you have any questions, please put them into the chat. Um, so I'm hoping most of you are well experienced with Zoom after a year of the pandemic um, and similar tools. Um, but if you look in your Zoom window, there should be a little chat icon that will bring up a box where you can type things in. Um, Paul and I will be accumulating the questions and, uh, and then we'll, we'll have John answer them at our question and answer or any lull in the activity and he has a, a moment to talk. Um, so at this point, I would like to turn it over to John. Excellent. Okay. So let me just share my screen here for a moment. Um, Okay, at this point, hopefully everyone can see uh, my screen, uh, one of the telescope control screens here. Yes, we can see your screen, John, thank you. Excellent, and so right now we are just in the middle of getting our evening calibrations with the telescope. Um, so what you're seeing here is, oops, sorry, just as I set things up. So <clears throat> what you see here um, is the latest image uh, from, the, from the telescope. And it's going to take another one. Um, so what we're doing here is uh, what are called uh, flat fields. Um, and so these are one of the uh, type of calibration data that we need um, to account for the fact that telescopes and the cameras we use are not perfect instruments. Um, so there are a number of issues we've run into. Um, the purpose of the flat field is actually to account for the non-uniform response of the camera. So um, the cameras we use 
um, are basically fancy digital cameras. They're made up of arrays of pixels. Um, and those pixels all respond slightly differently to light. Um, and so if we don't take account of that, <clears throat> then um, any brightness variations we see in our actual scientific images that we take, we, we can't be sure if those are due to the quality of the camera or due to actual, you know, real variations in brightness um, of an astronomical object. Um, and so to account for this, we take a, an observation of a uniformly illuminated um, field. So you can use a uniformly illuminated white screen in the dome, um, but the best way to do flat fields is actually with the twilight sky. Um, and let me bump up my closure time here. Um, because at either sunrise or sunset, the sky is bright enough that you don't see any stars. You just get kind of a uniformly illuminated um, surface, assuming you don't have clouds. Um, but uh, it's not bright enough to, um, it, it's faint enough that we can, we, we can see it without, you know, we can observe it with our cameras. Um, and so what you're seeing on the right here is an example um, of a flat field. Um, I'm just reading out. And what you'll notice is it's not particularly flat. Um, if everything were perfect, if the telescope and the camera um, were perfect, um, you would just see a flat white image. There would be no difference in how the instrument responded or in the light from, from the telescope. And you would just see a flat white image. Um, what you can actually see is the, the corners are darker, the, the center is brighter. You can see these rings on the image. Um, and so these are all things we need to correct for, and that's what the flat field allows us to do. Um, these rings on the image are actually um, dust, um, either on the, on the telescope mirror or on the filters. And because they are out of focus, um, telescopes are focused at infinity. We're, we're focused for very far away objects. Um, so things that are very close are out of focus, and so you get these characteristic uh, uh, circles. Uh, let me just check the count value. Okay, so we're good. Um, and so right now I am changing to a different filter, um, and so we can discuss. We'll talk about that a little more um, later on. Um, but basically, the camera has a number of filters in front of it that determine what color we're looking at. Um, and we need flat fields in uh, each of those different filters um, to correct our data later on. Um, twilight flats are a pretty hectic uh, time, as, uh, as you'll gather from this. Um, things will settle down a lot once we're done with twilight flats and we can move on to actual um, observing. Um, but uh, any astronomer will tell you twilight flats are a, a pretty hectic, fast-paced part of the evening because you only have a relatively short amount of time when the sky is bright enough to do this um, before it gets too dark and you start seeing, uh, start seeing stars. Um, so I will explain a little more about each of the controls that we use here um, when we have a little more time. Don't time slightly. Um, but we want to get a few exposures in each of the filters um, to account for this difference in uh, in camera response and, as I said, things like dust on the mirror. Um, you may wonder why we don't just clean the telescope or uh, the filter, and we do. Um, but, um, you know, no nothing is perfect, and so you always end up with, with something left on the mirror. You don't want to be too, um, too harsh with, uh, with telescope mirrors. They're, they're pretty, you know, they're, they're, they can be fragile things. Um, and it's relatively easy to correct for, um, to, to correct for these things. So it's not something we worry hugely about. Okay, excellent. Um, and so what I'm doing here in between each image is I'm actually moving the telescope slightly. Uh, whoops, I do not want. Uh, 
Um, and so the reason I'm moving the telescope slightly between each image um, is because if, um, as, as we get further from, uh, from sunset, more into twilight, uh, we will start to see stars pop up in our images. Um, as, as the sky gets darker, we will start to see stars in these images. And that's bad um, because a star in your flat field is, is not due to the response of the, of the camera or, um, or the telescope, you know, it is something real. Um, so, and so what we do is we, we nudge the telescope uh, between each uh, observation. And uh, that means that we can take a sequence of flat fields we can combine them together and average everything out. And because you've moved the telescope, um, the, any stars will be at a, at a different position in each image. And uh, that's my fault. Um, and so when you, uh, stars will be at different points in each image. And so when you combine them, um, if you average them out, um, if you have five images, um, on average, at any point, there will be no star at uh, any given point uh, because the star will only appear in one of the images. Um, another thing I'm doing here is I am checking the count level of the um, of, of the image each time. Um, so just to give you some idea. So this is our, our image. Um, and over here, this window labeled control, we have a value here that tells us how bright any given pixel in the camera is. Um, and basically, we want to make sure that we have um, and that we're getting enough light in each of the pixels that the data are useful, um, but not too much to the point where the uh, camera is unable to count uh, the light we're getting. The, the, the CCD, the camera has a limited response. Um, it can't count light indefinitely. Um, excellent. And so this next one should be the last. Um, and so as things get, uh, as, as the sky is getting darker, um, as we get further and further from sunset, it's a constant balancing act of um, increasing our exposure time to get enough light uh, to make these. Uh, to make these observations useful. Um, so the uh, the instrument we're using uh, the is a CCD camera. I said it's basically a fancy digital camera. Um, and in front of that, we have a filter wheel with uh, four different filters. Um, I will talk a little bit more about them in a minute, um, but we are currently on the third of four filters. So once this is done, we will move on to our final filter, take our final flat fields in that filter, um, and then we can get on to uh, the rest of our setup. Excellent, that is reading out. Um, so you can see here, um, so this is our instrument control, and so this is what we use to change our filters. So I'm going to move to the fourth filter now. Switch off the telescope slightly. Okay, let's see how this looks. Um, so one thing to note is, um, so I have moved, so I've moved through the filters from, uh, so we have four filters, they're looking at uh, blue light, green light, red light, and infrared light effectively. Um, and so we start with the, um, with the bluer filters, um, and as we get further into, further from sunset, we move towards the redder filters. Um, because the sky will remain bright at, uh, at those wavelengths for longer, whereas we lose the blue light um, very quickly. Um, so let's see. Okay, so we need to bump up the exposure time. seconds. So you can see we are only, what are we, we are 8.50, so we're about half an hour past sunset at this point, um, and we're already up to 
half minute exposures, even in the reddest filter that we're using. Um, so you can see basically within maybe 35 to 40 minutes after sunset, um, flat fields are no longer tenable. So you have this very, very short window um, right after sunset or alternatively right before sunrise um, where you can take these observations. Um, otherwise, uh, you can use, um, uh, you, you can do at any point during the day uh, flats within the dome if you have a flat field screen, which we do. Um, so I did actually take earlier this afternoon, I did take some dome flats, um, but uh, they are not ideal. They are not as good as sky flats in general. Um, so when you can, we always want to get, get sky flats. Of course, sometimes you are stymied by things like um, the weather. Um, often if it's cloudy or you know, worse, um, at sunset, you, uh, you, you will find yourself unable to take uh, twilight flats. Um, but we got very lucky today. We've actually got excellent weather. So uh, good stead. OK, so this will be the third image. I'll take another two after this. Um, we try to take an odd number of images um, so that when we can combine them, uh, we can do um, median com uh, combinations. So you don't, uh, your um, things like uh, a normal arithmetic average gets will get pulled around by um, by the stars, whereas median combines help us filter out those stars. Um, so you want an odd number of images. Um, it also helps if something weird happens in one, say an airplane flies through or um, anything, you can uh, throw out an image and you've still got a decent number to work with. OK. So John, are you ready to take a couple questions? For uh, absolutely, go for it. OK, well, first of all, I want to remind people that if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat. If you're a little embarrassed uh, and don't want to put it where everyone can read it, feel free to just direct message me, um, Eleanor, Eleanor Gates. Um, and, and that way, you know, we, we uh, you know, you don't have to be embarrassed uh, and, and feel free to ask anything about astronomy or what's going on this evening. Um, but anyway, John, our first question is it appears from the flat that a color camera is being used. Might a monochromatic camera be more sensitive? Excellent question. So this is actually a monochrome camera. Uh, if I hit the black and white button here, that's kind of the true, um, the, the, the color you're seeing here is just a color map. Um, uh, it, it's not true color in any way. Um, so the, the actual camera is, is monochromatic. Um, it just counts light. Um, and so that is why we use the, uh, the filters that I mentioned, um, because that is how we can get color information. Um, if you put a blue filter in front that only lets blue light through, um, and uh, so you will get an, you'll get an idea of how bright an object is in, in blue. You can do that for green, red, and then you can combine them and make a nice pretty color image. Um, but, but yes, our detector is, is monochromatic. Um, it, it just counts light. So one of the participants noticed that one of the images you took had a bright streak through it, a really bright streak. What was it? Indeed. So I mentioned that I am nodding the telescope um, in between. And in that one, I simply did not wait for the telescope to stop moving before I took an image. Um, so you see the, that, that was a star that happened to pop up. And because I was moving the telescope, you see it as this nice long streak. Um, so that was my own uh, little bit of uh, impatience there on my part. OK, and this should be the last one. OK, and we did have a couple late comers. So if you could explain again what the purpose of these flat field images are and what the dark donuts in the image. Absolutely. So these are flat field images. Um, they are one type of calibration that we take. Um, and these are used to basically account for the fact that our detector, our CCD detector, which is basically a fancy digital camera, um, is not perfect. Um, 
So um, if everything were perfect, if the camera and the telescope were, you know, ideal, um, you would just see a flat white image here. Um, instead, you can see that it's kind of brighter in the center, fainter out towards the edge. Um, we have some edge effects out here, um, actually from the filter, and you have these dark spots. Um, so the detector isn't perfect. It's made up of a number of pixels, um, like in any digital camera. Um, and each of those did, uh, each of those pixels will respond slightly differently to light. Um, and so this is uh, one of the things we're correcting here for. We observe a uniformly illuminated surface. Um, in this case, the sky just after sunset, um, when it's you know still bright enough that we can that, that we're getting kind of um, uniform illumination. Um, and so that will then tell us how each of the pixels responds differently to light. Um, the other things you see here are due to um, things like dust on the telescope or on the filters. And so that's these um, dark rings you see here. Um, they are dust grains on, uh, on the surface, which are massively out of focus, because of course our telescope is focused to look for very distant astronomical objects. Um, so anything that's very close is very out of focus. And so uh, that's what you see here, out of focus dust um, on the telescope. Um, and so that's, again, something we want to correct for, um, because if you have astronomical objects that kind of say you were looking at something that moved over the course of the night and it moved from a bright patch of the detector to a darker patch, you wouldn't know if that change in brightness was inherent to the astronomical object or just due to the fact that it's moving on the detector to a darker uh, point. So uh, these flat fields basically tell us how light, how, how the detector varies um, across its entire field and lets us correct for that in our actual scientific images. Okay, Rob in the chat asks, wouldn't dome flats be more reproducible? Also, instead of taking three flats, you could take 20 and get better noise processing. So it's true with dome flats, they are much more reproducible. Um, you can basically take a, you know, you, you, you know what exposure time you're going to use and you can take a whole bunch of them. Um, the downside to dome flats is they are usually not perfect. Uh, again, nothing is perfect in life. You know, this is um, one of the things we fight. Um, so for example, with our, um, with our flat field screen, we do have a flat white screen in the dome that we can illuminate either with lamps on the top end of the telescope, or we have some lamps uh, that are mounted at the bottom of the flat field screen. Um, both of those, ne neither of those are perfect. So the, the lamps at the top end of the telescope are mounted behind the top ring of the telescope. So when we use those lamps, we actually cast some shadow um, onto the onto the flat field screen. So we introduce some structure with those lamps. Um, similarly, with the flat with the flat field screen lamps that are mounted at the bottom, because they're mounted at the bottom of the screen, you get more light at the bottom versus at the top. We have a gradient of of illumination using those lamps. Um, so that is, there's kind of pluses and minuses to both. We, 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 with the dome flats, we can take more of them, but there is some inherent structure in the, in, in the dome flats because of, because of illumination. Uh, whereas on the sky, assuming we don't have clouds, um, we don't have those illumination issues. Um, so it's a, there is a trade-off there. Um, again, if you could make a perfect flat field screen that perfectly reflected light at all wavelengths and was perfectly evenly illuminated, um, then yes, but uh, that is not, uh, you know, that's not what we have. So, so in our case, at least dome flats are, uh, uh, sorry, sky flats are the better option uh, for us. So Naf in the chat says, mm -hmm. what about LED lights for dome flats? So, uh, I mean, you'd have to worry. So one of the things you'd have to worry about is the kind of spectrum of the lights, because, you know, we want an even illumination over all, we're observing in a number of filters. So we're observing in the blue, visible, 
red through to infrared so we need things that can illuminate well in over those um over a, a large wavelength range um so again that's a a, a limitation um so so yeah there's uh so I'm not actually sure. Um, I'm assuming we're using we're not using LED at the moment. Um, yeah, the, the lamps we're using tend to be uh, quartz lamps, mm -hmm. so, so they, they have a relatively flat um, and yeah. even illumination. Um, so okay, so we'll we'll have one more question right now, and uh, then we'll let John move on to the next calibration activity, so that we can actually keep the moving night, uh, the, the night moving along. Uh, Richard asks, what are the white spots that showed up in the image? Excellent. So, <clears throat> so, so some of these white spots are going to be stars. So um, if I activate the magnifying, so for example, this is a star. That is uh, creeping into our um, into our image because we're dark enough now that we can actually see stars in a 55 second exposure. Um, some of the um, white spots you'll see will be um, hot pixels. So, so again, our detector is not perfect. Um, so, for example, this black column here, um, and then this column over here, um, you can see runs the entire length of the detector. So those are bad pixels on the detector. Um, because some pixels just do not respond well um, at all. Some don't respond at all. Some are always reporting the maximum counts. Um, so again, that is something we can take account of with um, things like the um, like the flat field again tells us about pixels that do not respond well. Um, okay. So thank you, John. Um, we're getting tons of great questions. Keep them coming. Good. We'll try to get to them all. Some of your questions will be answered as we go. So I <laughs> skipped a couple right now, assuming that John will cover them shortly. Um, and so we'll keep you in suspense. Um, just a reminder for those, or, or just uh, for those of you that signed in late, I'm Eleanor Gates. I am the, the host and moderator for tonight's special Friends of Lick Observatory event. My colleague, uh, I'm a sorry, I'm a resident staff astronomer here at Lick Observatory. Paul Lynham, who is also a staff astronomer here at Lick Observatory, is also helping moderate and will be answering questions in the chat if we don't get to them um, live with John. And then John Reese is our newest resident astronomer on the mountain. So you actually have a rare treat of having all three resident astronomers giving you attention this night and, and hope we. Uh, it, um, helping you learn some more about how we do operations here at the observatory. Um, so keep the questions coming. Uh, if you're shy, don't want to put it in the chat so everyone can see that, feel free to direct message me, Eleanor Gates. Um, and uh, I'll let John continue on with the next steps for getting ready for observing so we can get to some pretty picture objects soon. Excellent. So the first thing that uh, I'm going to do now is check the pointing of the telescope to make sure that we that it actually points where we expect it to. Um, so I've turned the uh, lights on in the dome here for a moment. Um, so you can see uh, the web cameras that we have inside the dome. Um, so we are operating the telescope uh, remotely. We are, you know, I'm, I, we are on the mountain, um, but I am not at the telescope physically. Um, so this is the way we keep an eye on it and make sure that uh, you know, it's, uh, it's safe. Um, and so you'll see once I start moving, you'll be able to see the telescope uh, move. So this on the left here is a view um, through the forks, through the mount of the telescope here. And then on the right here, we have a view from the top end of the telescope. Um, so you may be able to just make out we have the um, edge of the dome slit here and then the top end of the telescope is here pointing out of that uh pointing out to look at the sky um so here i have a list of um bright easy to find stars so we are going to uh move to one of those um this is our telescope control interface so this is how we actually move the telescope um so we enter the coordinates we want to move to Nice move to target button, and you will see the telescope start to move. 
Um, everything is computer controlled with this telescope, so it makes our life nice and easy. Um, and there we go. You'll see the telescope start to move. Uh, the dome is slaved to the telescope so that the, the dome slit is always in front of the telescope. So you'll see the dome start to rotate. Um, in uh, the image on the left here, you can see the dome and the telescope moving together. Um, and then uh, we will wait until uh, the telescope control tells us that the telescope has reached its, uh, reached its target. Um, and so you can see here is a readout of the actual current location of the, or where the telescope thinks it's currently pointing. Um, we will check to see if that is correct. So it thinks it has now reached the target. Um, so at this point, I will actually turn the dome lights off because we don't want lights on while we are observing. Um, but it's nice to see the telescope while it's moving. So telescope thinks it is, uh, it is there. So we are going to take an image. This is a bright star, so we will need we won't need a very long exposure. I'm going to change the filter back to V. So V is visual. It's a green filter, so this will let green light through um, to the telescope. Uh, a three-second exposure should be plenty. We will see. Um, so you'll see here that. Um, we start taking our exposure, it will flush the chip, so it'll zero out the charge on the CCD, and then the shutter will open for about three seconds, it'll count the light, and then it will start reading out the image. And uh, then when it's done, we will see it here. Um, you'll note it does take some time to read out the image. So even though it's only a three second exposure, we're only, we're only open to light for three seconds, it takes longer than that to uh, read out the image. So if you take a lot of short exposures, um, you spend a lot of time reading out um, versus exposing, but you can see a very bright star here. Um, you can see it's not quite at the center of the CCD. Um, if, again, if, if the pointing was, was uh, perfect, it would be dead center, um, but things do, uh, do vary. Um, so that's one of the things we check is to make sure that uh, things are as centered as they can be. So let's see. So uh, down here in the, again, in the control window, as, along with the brightness reading, you can see we have a row and column value. Um, and so the, the detector is 2000 pixels by 2000 pixels. So if it were dead center, it would be at, uh, effectively 1000, 1000. You can see that it's actually at uh, row 1354. 1352, column 606. So we're off by a few hundred pixels. Um, so we will correct for that. So let's see. We want to go. Six ten. So we want to move. 390 pixels uh, and whoops. Okay, so we want to move 352 pixels. And so um, we know the nickel, um, we, we know the physical scaling between pixels to physical distance on the sky. Um, so I can translate that pixel distance to a distance on the sky. So we want to move 70, 70 arc seconds east. And then I want to move. Sixty-three down. So, assuming I have done this right, once the telescope finishes moving, we should see the uh, star centered up. We can see it's just moving slightly. Oops. Uh, 
the quick exposure and assuming I've done my maths right and got things the right way around, um, we should see the telescope, the star move towards the center. Of course, this being a live event, no doubt I will have got something flipped and uh, we'll see it move further away, but uh, we shall see. So uh, the nice thing about direct imaging, so using a camera like this, we have a relatively wide field of view. So even though things aren't perfect, we can still see the star in the field of view. And there we go, basically, uh, we got things right. So we've moved almost to the center of the uh, CCD. Let me just change the scaling slightly. So there's the star roughly in the center of our field of view, uh, much better than it was before. Um, so our pointing is now good. So we can tell the telescope that actually where it's pointed now is where we asked it to go. So uh, that will update our um, our pointing model, tell the telescope actually this is, uh, this is where the, uh, the star actually is. Um, but as you can see, we weren't far off. Um, the pointing on the nickel is actually pretty good. Um, so I, I have used telescopes with a lot worse. Okay, so now we know the telescope is pointing in the correct location. So the next thing we want to do is actually focus the telescope. Um, because if I send uh, this next one, I will turn the dome lights on and we will see the uh, telescope move again just slightly. We're not moving far. Um, like this won't take very long at all. Um, but yeah, so we want to focus the telescope to make sure that we're getting the best images we can. Um, the focus of the telescope will change with things like temperature as, as things cool down. Um, you know, the telescope is made of metal, so it will physically shrink um, slightly. And that is enough to move things out of focus. So to, to compensate for that, we actually move um, one of the mirrors up and down to compensate for uh, the change in the size of the telescope. Um, okay, and so um, we are there. And so to, to focus, what we will actually do, shall I pull up the focus GUI? So we will, uh, let me close this one and get this out of the way because now I want this. Um, what I'm actually going to do is, um, defocus, uh, unfocus the telescope on purpose. Um, so we'll move that mirror um, out of focus and then we'll move it um, in steps through focus and out of focus the other side. Um, we'll take a series of images of our focus star and what we'll see is the star will start off out of focus and relatively large. It'll shrink down to a nice in focus small spot and then as we move through focus and come out the other side it'll uh, increase in size again. And so basically we can look at that, figure out where the star is smallest and best focused, and that will be our focus value. So I am going to go ahead and uh, unfocus the telescope. So we started at a value of 368. Always good to know where you started so you can get back there if you mess up. And let's go to value 350. And this is a fainter star, so I'm going to take a longer exposure. And I'm going to take an exposure. Okay, so that has started. Um, let's see how this looks, and then we'll uh, start our focus exposure. So as I said, I have uh, defocused the telescope on purpose here. So instead of seeing these nice 
or relatively round circles, you'll see things um, a lot larger. Um, so you can see there we have a characteristic donut shape. Things are uh, not well focused. So excellent. Um, so I'm going to take. So uh, what I'm going to do here is actually start a long exposure. I'm going to pause it, move the telescope, resume the exposure. Um, and so you'll see we'll end up with um, a nice trail um, of uh, the star moving. And uh, we'll see a nice trail of focus positions when we read out. Um, OK, let's start that. Little flush the chip, zero everything, and then we wait for about 10 seconds. Okay, so we've paused the exposure, so we're no longer collecting light. Uh, we will then move the telescope by a small amount and change the focus by a small amount. Um, we'll see both the focus, the uh, mirror is moving and is now green, so it's now there. The telescope has moved slightly, so everything is in position. And so at that point, we can resume. And so another 10 seconds later. And so because we are not reading out here, we are just pausing the exposure, you'll note that the image on the right is not updating at all. Um, so it won't update until we get to the end and actually Okay. So, John, a question. Yes. Absolutely, go ahead. Do you mean to have the lights on in the dome while you do? I this? do not. Thank you. <laughs> and this is what happens when I try to do too too many things at once. Thank you, whoever that was. Well, let's go back to three fifty. Let me throw that one away. Moment. That one. Let's go back to the target. So let's start that one again. See, it's very easy to uh, to make mistakes here. The joy of live events. So now the lights are off. We're good. And 10 seconds. And so now we'll do exactly the same again. Move the telescope slightly, move the focus slightly. Excellent. And twenty. So uh, we started at a focus of about 368. So that'll be roughly right. That'll be roughly where we expect focus to be. As I said, things will change with temperature. Um, so we'll move through that and uh, come out the other side. And then we will get on to pretty pictures. But uh, this is all the, uh, the background setup that uh, we have to do before uh, before any observing. So this is all the, the hidden stuff that uh, normally gets done in the background before. Oh, uh, and uh, I should say one of the nice things at Lick is uh, 
I have chosen to focus in the V filter. Um, it's the visual, that's the green. Um, but I could focus in any of our filters because they are all um, what we call parfocal. They, 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 are all fo they all focus the same. Um, that is not always the case, um, depending on how thick a filter. So the filter is usually a, a piece of glass. Um, so depending on how thick that is, you can change your instrument focus. So uh, sometimes you end up having to focus in multiple filters um, rather nicely here. We don't have that issue. We can focus in any of our wideband in our uh, in any of our filters, and it will all be the same. So that makes our lives slightly easier. Um, One more, and we should be good after this. Okay, telescope's moving, mirror is moving, and done, and done. So another 10 seconds. Actually, I will just read out. So at this point, I am actually just going to read out the image. So we'll see now, it will read out. And what you'll see is a string of stars, um, some defocused, some focused. And so we will use that to determine the best telescope focus. Um, so to do that, we actually have a, uh, an automated tool that will fit things for us and tell us the best focus value. And there we go. So you can see at the top here, um, this is where we started. So we have a very out of focus image. Um, and then uh, as we move down, things get smaller, better focused. And then uh, as we move through, you can see again, we're getting out of focus. We're getting that kind of classic donut shape again. Um, so I can tell it to what I should do is erase any. And so we started at a value of 350. So all I'm doing is telling it what each of these uh, stars, uh, what position, what uh, focus value it represents. And then you'll see it start to oops, to fit a nice uh, parabola. So you can see where, uh, so this is the, uh, basically the, the uh, size of that um, star. And you can see where we're decreasing as we move towards focus. So unsurprisingly, we still, better. And now we'll start to uh, get worse. And so it says our best focus is at 365, and you can actually see that um, in the image that uh, when we're at 365, the, uh, the star is noticeably rounder than uh, when we started. So we weren't far off when we uh, started this night. It was at 368. And so those are just generic um, kind of motor encoder counts. Um, but uh, whoops, 365. 
So it's very important we actually move back to focus and don't leave the telescope uh, defocused. Um, that would be a bad thing, um, but a very easy, uh, an easy mistake to make. Ask me how I know. Um, excellent. Okay, so the telescope is now focused. So at this point, we know the telescope is pointing correctly. We know the telescope is focused. So uh, at that point, we are actually ready to uh, to go look at uh, real or oh, um, interesting uh, objects. So, so John, do you have time yes. to answer a couple questions? Before... Absolutely. Okay. So, um, but asked from Rob. Why don't you use pinpoint or other such tool for pointing the telescope? Um, so, I mean, I have used a variety of tools in the past. Um, the when we were at uh, so at NMSU, we used a thing called Focus Max, which did something very similar, um, slightly automated, but again, just moved the focus value in and out and looked at the size of the stars. Um, so. You know, most of these things do basically the, the, the same thing. Um, we, we use it. Um, I mean, we have our own in-house tool. Um, it works well. Um, it's, uh, I, I personally like this method because it's um, great from a teaching point of view. Um, when uh, you, so, so um, automated tools are great, but it's nice to be able to show um, students, especially, you know, what's going on under the hood. Um, and uh, so, so I, I, I like methods like this because it's a relatively, it's still a relatively quick process, um, but you can easily make sure it is doing the right thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, different, uh, different observatories will use different things, but. Uh, okay, and this question sounds like it's from one of our amateur astronomers. <laughs> in our member pool, um, is polar alignment and collimation part of the nightly routine, or is it on a needed interval basis? So it's not part of the nightly routine. Um, you know, our, our mount is, <laughs> is very firmly fixed in place. Um, the, uh, the, 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 you know, we're, you know, in a permanent uh, installation. Um, the collimation again is not something we check on a uh, certainly on a nightly basis. Um, I actually don't know how often the um, collimation is uh, actually checked as a matter of normal um, telescope maintenance. Um, yeah, um, yeah, Ellie, I don't know if you have any. Um, yeah, let me let me fill in. So yeah, we we typically collimate the telescope as best we can. Um, after we reilluminize the mirror. So every few years, we take the mirror out, strip off its old aluminum coating and put it back in the telescope. And it inevitably doesn't go in the telescope exactly the way it came out. So we have a procedure to tilt the primary mirror and align things. Um, someone commented in the chat that the slightly non-round donuts or unevenly illuminated donuts was an indication indeed that the telescope is not quite perfectly collimated. It is the best we can do with the available hardware. You know, this telescope was built in the 1970s. And uh, so there are some limitations from the, the initial construction of the telescope we, and the age of the telescope we need to contend with. Um, but it does a pretty good job. You'll see that the focused images are quite round and quite nice. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, not everyone is reading everything that's streaming through the chat, which is fascinating, but we're all riveted by what John is telling us on the screen. So one of the questions that came through the chat from Patty was, where exactly on the mountain is this telescope? Okay, so uh, the Nickel um, telescope is actually located up at the main building. It's in the um, smaller dome up at the main building, uh, the opposite side of the um, building to the to the great refractor. Um, so um, it's actually in the um, the dome that uh, was the first permanent installation on the mountain. Um, so uh, I, I love that about this that the the, the small dome we have there um, originally housed a twelve inch uh, refractor um, that was in use before the before the 36 inch, before the great refractor um, was constructed. Um, 
and then in the in, in the seventies, um, after um, Anna Nichol, um, a seamstress in San Jose, um, left some money to Lick Observatory, um, the the Nichol was built, so it replaced the twelve inch refractor, which at that point was uh, not a scientifically useful um, telescope. Um, so it's in the the smaller dome up at the up at the main building. Uh, sorry, Ellie. I... There we go. Yes. I... Okay. Yep. <laughs> I have to remember to unmute myself. Sorry <laughs> about that. Um, why don't we move on? Why don't John you select the first target that we're going to point to and talk about Excellent. all that software? What's happening? Indeed. And hopefully this time I'll remember to turn the lights off. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, let's move to our first um, actual object of the night. So we're going to go to M3, which is uh, a nice globular cluster. Um, so I'm going to send those coordinates over to our telescope control. I'm going to set the telescope moving. And uh, again, we'll see things start to move here. Um, so we will, um, as, as we move on through the night, we will uh, ask you all what uh, kind of object you'd like to go to next. But uh, as telescope operator, I'm going to uh, use my prerogative and go to uh, a globular cluster first, because they are one of my uh, favorite objects. Um, I'm slightly biased in that I've worked a lot in uh, my career on clusters, um, open clusters nearby, the, which are the nearby kind of younger stars. Um, as well as globular clusters, which are much, much further away and much, much older. Um, the stars in globular clusters are actually among some of the oldest um, in our galaxy. So uh, they are very interesting and exciting objects. Um, and they make uh, quite a visual impact as well, as you'll see. There's, uh, uh, compared to open clusters, um, which are the nearby ones, they're relatively young stars and very sparse. Um, globular clusters are much, much more um, compact, much more dense, and you'll see many, many stars. Okay, so the telescope says it is there. So we are going to remember to turn the lights off. And there go the lights. Okay, so globular clusters, relatively bright. Um, so let's take Let's take a one minute exposure and see what we see. So this is M3. I'm actually going to start recording images. Um, so all of those uh, so all of those focusing um, and pointing images I did not record because we don't uh, we don't care about those. Um, but uh, now that we're back to taking useful and interesting images, I'm going to start saving the images again. Um, and Let's see what we see, and then we can uh, adjust things as needed. Um, but uh, globular clusters, stars are relatively bright um, compared to things like nebulae or galaxies, so we won't need super long exposure times. Um, when we get onto things like uh, like galaxies or fainter targets, we'll we may take kind of few minute to five to ten minute exposures, um, but uh, these will be relatively short, um, which is, uh, again, makes for a, an interesting first object because we can actually start to see the pretty pictures um, fairly, uh, fairly immediately. Um, but uh, so uh, one of the um, kind of effects of the globular clusters being relatively bright. Um, so again, I say relatively, uh, most of these are not naked eye objects, um, but with even moderate sized um, telescopes, you, you, you can see them. Um, one of the side effects of that is that they are often discovered um, relatively early. Um, so uh, this is M3, um, so it's a Messier object um, and uh, was one of the, uh, so this was in the 1700s, I think this, so I think M3 was 1764. Um, so very early on, um, but uh, at the time, with the, the instruments of the time, it was not resolved as single stars. They were seen as kind of nebulous, fuzzy objects in the sky. Um, but you can see here, with the modern telescopes and modern equipment, we can see many, many, many stars here. 
Um, and so this is why I love globular clusters. Um, they are easily one of my favorite objects in night in the night sky. You can see, you know, e even with, you know, moderate exposures, one minute exposures, not particularly long, with a one meter telescope, which is, you know, large in terms of what many of us um, would interact with in our normal lives, but in terms of research telescopes is, you know, on the smaller side these days, you can still see a huge number of stars. Um, so um, globular clusters uh, have, uh, you know, about, well, a lot of stars. So, so uh, M3 has about half a million stars in total. Um, and so they are, um, they're, they're a source of a lot of the older stars in our galaxy. Um, and uh, so you can see here, so this is in uh, V, so this is in uh, green light. Um, I mentioned that globular clusters tend to be some of the oldest stars in our galaxy. Um, and so you may know that um, the color of a star depends on, um, uh, generally depends on its age. Um, so older stars tend to be much more red. Um, and so we may actually see that if we switch filters. Um, so we're currently observing in visual or which is green. Um, we can move to the R band, uh, which is red. So we're now moving to look at red light. And so, um, that's now moved. So we'll take another exposure in the red band, and you may actually uh, be able to discern a difference in brightness with these stars, because many of these will be very red stars. So you'll see they'll be brighter in the redder filters, versus if we went to bluer filters, um, they would be much, much fainter. Um, and uh, so that is one of the ways that we can get information in astronomy, um, because, uh, of course, we can't E even with nearby objects, you know, it's uh, very difficult to go to anything and physically study it. Um, anything outside our own solar system, not hope. Um, so basically, the only information professional astronomers have is is light, is is how bright something is. And so one of the tricks we can do um, is put filters in front of our camera and look at how bright objects are in different filters, how bright they are in blue light versus red light versus infrared light. And you, doing that, we can we can figure out a lot about objects. So as I said, things like age of stars, older stars are redder. Um, temperature, hot stars are much more blue, cooler stars, again, much more red. Um, and so we'll read out here. Um, and then we'll see what we see. Um, so I should say when I talk about old um, in terms of globular clusters, when I say they're among the oldest stars, um, I'm talking uh, billions of years. So M3 is uh, about 11 billion years old. Um, excellent. So we have our red. I'm going to go ahead and take one in the I band, which is infrared. So we're now moving uh, beyond kind of the limit of our eyes. Um, and this is one of the major um, revolutionary things uh, that, um, to a certain extent, photographic plates, but um, certainly things like CCDs and digital detectors have opened up, is we can see things um, beyond the limit of our eyes. Um, because of course, for many years, visual astronomy is great. Um, I certainly don't think you can beat really physically looking through an eyepiece. Um, but, you know, the um, digital detectors have certainly opened up whole new realms of, uh, of astronomy. Um, so we will now be looking at things uh, beyond what our eye can see. And you'll, you'll, uh, th this is similar to things like um, you'll notice in the things like the Hubble images, the very nice, pretty pictures that Hubble makes, oftentimes are not true color. Um, they are usually, they usually involve things like some infrared light or maybe some UV, things that you can't see with your eyes, but that our modern instruments can detect. Let's see. John, are you willing to yeah. take a couple questions? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Go for it. OK, so um, let's see. Whoops, where'd the question go? Ah, from Michael. Do we have a sense of how much sky is covered by the sensor? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, the nickel, the CCD here uh, covers um, about six arc minutes on a side. Um, so a um, there are 60 arc minutes in a degree. So it's about a tenth of a degree by a tenth of a degree. And to give you some physical sense of how much that is, uh, the full moon is about a half a degree um, on the sky. Um, so, you know, we're talking about um, what a fifth of the full moon um, on the sky here. So we have a relatively um, comp, you know, we're, we're definitely looking at a very narrow section of the sky. Um, but uh, excellent. Yeah. So um, yeah, and, and that is a theme of, um, of of telescopes. You'll find most detectors are. Um, even the kind of the largest um, detectors um, will only cover at most a few degrees on the sky. Um, so we are really dealing with, you know, small, small areas. So, and uh, Everett asks, we'll just do one more question and then I'll let you go back to what you were doing. Um, why do the bright star centers have peculiar superimposed shapes on them? Is the camera saturating? So for many of the brighter objects, um, it may well be saturating. Uh, let's actually see. Um, so we are getting, um, so, so saturation, um, I should say is, uh, so, so I mentioned the detector can only count so much light. Um, so you will reach a point where um, you, the object is bright enough that um, the detector basically cannot count any more. Um, the, the pixels ca physically cannot um, contain more charge. They cannot count more light. Um, and so uh, at that point, we, 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 that point we term saturation. Um, and so some of the brighter objects likely will be um, saturated. Um, and so if we really wanted to do precision photometry and to really measure precisely how bright um, the stars in this image were, we could lower the exposure time. Of course, then if you take shorter exposures, you lose some of the faint stars um, that you can see. Um, so one way around that, um, and, the, and so this is the method I used to use when I was, um, when I observed clusters, is you can take a series of exposures at say 1, 10, 60, 100 seconds. And so then you get the information on the very bright stars from the short exposures, and you get the information on the faint stars from the long exposures. Um, but uh, you'll note we've moved to the blue filter there, and uh, you may notice that uh, that uh, the stars are uh, fainter, not surprisingly. So if I uh, flip back, so let me just. So this is a list of all of our images. Um, so if we compare the infrared, you can see a lot of these bright stars um, versus the blue. You can see things in general look a little um, fainter um, because we're not getting as much blue light from, uh, from these stars. John, if you're willing to take another quick question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marlene asks, how far away is the cluster? Excellent. So globular clusters are also fairly far away. So this one is about 35,000 light years away. Um, so a light year is the distance light travels in, in one year. Um, light, as uh, you may well know, is very, very fast. Um, so, so these things are very, very far away, um, and that's one of the reasons that they're kind of so. Um, they, they're, you know, as I said, we're looking at a small area of the sky, a very small area of the sky, but we can fit these half million stars into our field of view because they're so far away. It's a very compact object. Um, but uh, yes, these are typically uh, very, very far away. Um, our galaxy is. What about 50,000 50, light years um, in radius? Um, 
And so these are 35,000 light years away. So these are an appreciable fraction of the galaxy uh, away from us. Um, but, uh, but because there are so many stars and so many massive stars in these, we, we can still see them. Um, excellent. Any other questions um, on that, on, on this uh, sort of related to this at least before we uh, consider moving on? Because we've now got um, images for this cluster in blue, visual or green, red and infrared. So we've done all of our filters on this. So at some point in the future, we could even make pretty color pictures of this. Um, but uh, so I think we've got all of the uh, all of the images, um, at least initially for this one. So um, yeah, do we have any other questions before I start to move to another object? Yeah, I think let's move on to the next target. Excellent. So we'll uh, shift things up slightly now. Um, and instead of do it, so we'll move from uh, stars to uh, sorry, to galaxies. Um, so let's see. Do again. I'm going to go down my list here. I'm looking for M104. So this is the Sombrero Galaxy. And again, we will turn the lights on while the telescope moves. And excellent, lights are on, and we will move. Um, so yeah, we'll take a bit of a, a detour now and go from um, the globular cluster, which was uh, thousands of light years away from us. Now we'll move on to uh, a distant galaxy, which is millions of light years away from us. Um, so we're no longer looking inside the Milky Way. We are now, uh, and we can see the, uh, <laughs> Ooh, there in the camera. That is one thing I did not check was how close any of these objects are to the moon. Excellent. So it looks like we are there. So I'm going to remember to turn off the lights. And then let's see. Let's go back to, I always like to start in V. It's a nice uh, kind of middle of the road filter. Relatively bright galaxy. Um, so maybe a, let's see, so maybe a few minutes. Uh, I don't know if you have a better sense of this, Ellie, but three, five minutes. Oh, you are um, muted. The Sobrero has a reasonably bright high surface right. brightness so i would think two to three minutes would okay. be a good place to start okay so i may and also uh are mm -hmm. you willing to take a question while we wait for this exposure to go i absolutely am so greg noticed that it seemed like in the the blue image for the globular cluster this uh, he saw more faint stars than in the red image Interesting. Let's take a look. So that may also be a, some of that may be a scaling thing because of course, if we have the- I was about to say, let's lock the image scale. Yeah. Because uh, so, so by default, the, the scaling of the image will change depending on how bright the objects are. And there you go. So if I lock the scale and stop things, um, so, so it rescales based on the brightness of the objects. Um, in this, we have many, many bright objects. Um, and so you can see the actual um, difference between the two there. Um, so, so some of that, I, yeah. So some of that is a so a uh, the the image scaling, um, how it translates, counts to physical display can uh, can hide some things like that. So, but, uh, you ready for another question? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. We've got we've got time. Yeah, I was about to say this is this is great. So many good questions. Do you use narrowband filters on the nickel very much? 
So we do have narrowband filters. So, so um, for some context here, um, so the filters that I'm talking about here, when I mention blue, green, um, I can actually, while we wait to read out, I can show you what I'm talking about. Um, so this is a filter plot. Um, and basically it is as a function of color or wavelength on the bottom, how much light is let through the filter. So you can see the blue filter here lets through a lot of light at about 400 and for, uh, around 400 nanometers, which is in the blue band. Um, v is centered on the green, on the peak response of the human eye, actually. Um, R is centered more in the red, and I in the infrared is, is centered in the infrared. Um, but you can see these are very wide filters. They let in a large range of light from, so for example, the infrared filter will let light in from about 700 to 900 nanometers. So it's a, a, a big range that they will let light through. Um, Whereas uh, we do have other filters called narrowband filters that will have much more uh, narrow profiles and will only let in very small amount uh, uh, of wavelengths. So those are useful for thing for looking at kind of specific emissions from say hydrogen alpha. Um, and uh, so we do have sets of narrowband filters um, for the nickel, but they are not used very often um, at all. In fact, I don't think any of the groups that have used the nickel in the year I've been here have used narrowband filters at all. Um, I should tell you uh, how common that is. Um, Ellie can probably comment on historical um, use, but yeah, I certainly have not used, uh, seen the narrowband filters used uh, since I have been here. It is much more, um, that people are much more interested in, in the broader band filters, um, which uh, also helps because the nickel is uh, you know, a relatively small telescope you want more light. Um, okay, I think I'm actually going to unlock that and let's. Whoops, it's really scaling. See the very bright center. I'm going to go ahead and let it automatically scale. What counts are we getting? So we are getting a decent number of counts in 180 seconds. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and change filters before I start playing with things, just because it's going to take another few minutes. So OK, excellent. See if we can see the. I was gonna say I think you might you know, try compressing the color scale rather than expanding. Yeah, it. sorry. Yeah. What I want to do is get the. No, no, no. Yeah, might help to clip the color scale as well. Thank you. So what John's doing right now is just changing how the colors are mapped to the intensity in, in the image, trying to bring out the details of the light from the galaxy and the dust lane in the galaxy. Indeed. So because you can see that the sombrero has a very bright uh, core, a very bright center, um, but it also has a nice. Yeah. And one of our chat members is saying, mm -hmm. looks like you have too much gradient from the moon. And it's that true. We is not helping to, tonight. The, uh, <laughs> to the full moon. Um, you know, even in the background here, we're getting 10,000 counts. So um, 
you know, we are 10,000 counts above background, but we are close to the moon. Um, I don't know if one of our other yeah. galaxies is. Multiple slightly... people have mentioned M51 is better positioned. Uh, yes. so so M51 maybe... is the other one I have on the list here. Um, but when we read out the red image, it should be a little more yeah. obvious where the dust lane is. Oh. But, you know, I mean, you know, this light has traveled for 40 million light years. Yes. So it's been traveling 40 million years before hitting the detector where we can see its light. Yeah. So, um, and, and so, so this is, um, so if you compare, so you will, uh, you, you may notice that when we look, when, you know, if we see the dust lane on this, we'll be looking at this relatively edge on. Um, the sombrero is a spiral like the Milky Way, but rather than seeing it face on and seeing the spiral arms, um, instead it just so happens to be inclined in such a way that we see it edge on, so we can see the, uh, the dust lane across the, uh, the bright center. Um, but it's a little smaller than the Milky Way. It's about half the size of the Milky Way. Um, so our, our galaxy is a relatively large one. Um, but uh, again, coming back to clusters, one of the reasons I, I like the Sombrero is it, it has one of the highest number of globular clusters in any galaxy that we know of. Um, so I think there's something like one to 2,000 globular clusters um, in the Sombrero galaxy um, versus a couple of hundred in our own. Um, so it has uh, many, many more clusters. So it's an excellent target for uh, extragalactic globular cluster studies. Um, and yes, we're still getting a lot of lunar illumination. So we are actually approaching the uh, scheduled end oh. of our evening at 10 p.m., which oh, so wow. time has just absolutely flown by. However, um, I'm raring to keep going. This is actually yes. quite fun. Agreed. Um, so if other people are willing to keep going on, uh, we can certainly do that. Um, I am going to put up a poll yes. now is so a good time. that we poll. can find out, you know, if most people want to go to a galaxy, M51 is the likely choice, but there are all sorts of other targets out there. So I will start a poll and you can select what type of object you want us to look at next. Excellent. So we'll give you a minute to look at everything. The choices are a galaxy, a star cluster, a nebula, binary star, a supernova, or an asteroid. So we'll give people a moment. Votes are still coming in. <laughs> And okay, has the voting stopped? Nope, still well, have. Still going on. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, it's going to be a toss up. <laughs> okay, I'll give you another you know, 15, 20 seconds to put, put your poll in. Oh, That's Steve in the chat quips, I want to see a UFO. Sorry, we can't just dial those up. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're going to end the poll, and oh, and it looks like we'll share the results here. But it looks like the nebula squeaked out the galaxy. Okay. So, uh, so sorry for those of people that wanted M fifty one right now. Not going to happen. But you know, if we have time, we might do it later if people still want. But it looks like a nebula is the choice. Okay. So, John, what do you have for us? So we have NGC 6210. Ooh. So let's see. So again, let's throw the lights on. Oh, no, that is not observed. So while John sets up the telescope, if you have uh, getting too tired, it's been too long a day with all sort of exciting things going on on the weekend. Um, thank you very much for attending. Um, we really appreciate your support and uh, 
Um, we, we hope that uh, someday COVID will be over sooner rather than later. So we'll be able to have people come back here to the mountain. Um, but until then, we will continue having our living room lecture and uh, Ask an Astronomer series starting up again for the summer uh, because we can't do our in-person events yet. Um, and we may do another event like this. Um, so uh, just uh, keep keep it going. If you have good ideas for other things that you'd like to see as, as a FOLO member, please let us know. You can always email social at uclook.org or FOLO at uclook.org with ideas that you want to see uh, uh, for potential events. Um, anyway, uh, uh, thank you very much for attending. And for those of you that want to stay on, I think we'll, we'll stay on for at least another 15 minutes, um, maybe longer if there's a lot of demand and, we're, and we as astronomers can keep up, you know, we're often stay up all night, so we're probably okay. Um, but as I said, if you can't stay, we've really enjoyed having you. And I believe this will be posted online later, right? So. Uh... Yes, this is being recorded and sometime early next week, we will post this on the UC Observatory's YouTube channel. Um, in fact, I put that in the chat at the beginning of the evening, um, and I will repeat that uh, YouTube channel information in the chat right now. And I don't have a good sense of exposure time for this. So again, I'm thinking a few minutes, but Ellie, you may have a better. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Of this brightness, so. Yeah, let's let's try three minutes. Okay, and see what it. Uh... Yeah. Okay. So, with luck, we won't saturate anything, <laughs> but we want to see some of the nebulosity. Excellent. So uh, again, we're kind of going in the opposite direction now. Um, so this is much, much closer to us. Um, so this is about six, six and a half thousand light years away. Um, so uh, a, a lot closer, but but much, much fainter. Um, so this is a planetary nebula. Um, so it's actually um, a good example of um, the sort of thing that will happen to our sun um, at the end of its lifetime. So this is a a star that has reached the end of its lifetime, um, and uh, or at least its, its main lifetime, and then has kind of puffed off its outer layers um, to form this, this nebula around it um, with a bright object left um, at the center. Um, and one of the interesting things about planetary nebulae is they only, re in, in astronomical timescales at least, they are, they're, they're very short-lived. Um, they only last for about 10,000 years. So of course, 10,000 years might sound like a long time, but in, in terms of, of, of astronomy, in terms of astronomical timescales, you know, most of the objects we look at, um, you know, millions to billions of years old and last, you know, last for, for millions or billions of years. Um, so to, to, to observe things, to see things that only last for a few thousand years is, uh, is uh, something that I think is, is pretty impressive in, uh, in, in astronomy, um, because uh, our, our sense of time scales definitely gets skewed. <laughs> but uh, we will, uh, yeah, we, we, we will uh, see that this is a much fainter object than uh, the clusters or even the galaxy, for example. Um, We will, uh, we will see. And they're uh, also much, much smaller than anything we've looked at so far. Um, so this one in particular is about just about one light year across. So, you know, when we're talking about um, the, the, the galaxies, which are, you know, hundreds of thousands of light years across, and then uh, the globular clusters, which are um, hundreds of light years across, um, we're now down to one light year 
in uh, in in physical size. Um, so these tend to be much much closer objects because the further away they are, the much much harder they are to resolve. Um, but uh, we will see how this looks in just about half a minute. Um, so while we wait for that, are there any other? Um, do we have any questions? Um, so so we. Do have a couple questions, as I said, but so many questions tonight. So, so we may not get <laughs> to them all. So uh, I apologize if we don't like your question. But uh, this this question was actually from quite early in the chat, and I, I don't know if you ever answered it or if it was ever asked. But uh, what is the dead man timer? Mm, that's a good question. I should have. Answered. So um, I mentioned that I am not physically at the telescope here. So this um, so this is our dead man timer. Um, this is what we use to make sure the telescope is safe when we are when we have a remote observer. Um, oh, look at that! We have a uh, streak through. So, um, but um, oh, and so that was a uh, exposure was too long. Um, so our let's, Ooh, let's try a thirty second. Yeah, let's see. Um, but you so can see all that faint nebulosity around the edge. Indeed. Um, but so the, the dead man timer here is a counter. It's a 20 minute timer. And so if I don't hit this button to reset that timer within 20 minutes, the telescope dome will close up and the mirror cover will close. And so um, that is there so that if our observer, who is not at the telescope, um, has internet issues or steps away and forgets to come back or falls asleep or anything happens, um, the telescope isn't left sitting open all night. Um, it'll close up if, uh, if, if anything happens. Um, and so of course, sometimes that can catch you out. Um, <laughs> one of the more common things to happen is you, you, forget, to, you forget that button exists and then the telescope closes up on you. And, um, but you can always reopen things, but it's, uh, it's there just to keep the telescope, yeah, telescope safe with remote observers. Um, if we were physically at the telescope, if I were up up there in the dome right now, um, we could disable the dead man timer. Um, but uh, since we're operating remotely, um, I, uh, we, we have that there. Excellent. OK. Yeah, go ahead and play with that color scale. Mm -hmm. Nice and we're away from the moon. Oops. Of course, grabbing the edge of it is sometimes a little <laughs> tricky <laughs> when it's small like that. There we go. Again, as I said, what I should do. You want me to try playing? Oh, uh, yeah. Please do. Another I'm going to yeah. set another exposure going in uh, red because uh, one of the golden rules of astronomy is always be exposing. <laughs> you want to be collecting photons for as much of the time as you can. But yeah, go ahead and poke, Ellie. Okay, great. Um, a little more. Uh, I have an idea of what might improve our uh, image view here. So now you can see the, the bright white dwarf at the center of the nebula, but not so much at the nebulosity. Oops, slow to update. But yeah, this is where other image display tools yes. can help you out a lot. And, and we have, you know, there's a free tool called DS9 that astronomers use a lot. Um, um, yeah. some more yeah, some our uh, image display is kind of good for a quick look um, as things come in, um, but uh, there are definitely more sophisticated tools out there for kind of more in yeah. depth, and we'll we'll see it update now as we move to. Yep, we'll just have an auto display. Yep, but here, you know, you can see those little lobes, you know, look very different at the redder wavelength than it did in the green. 
but this nebula is getting bigger over time. It's expanding, um, probably on the order of 50 to 100 kilometers per second. That gas is moving outwards from the white dwarf at the center. Oops, there's my that again. Trying to grab the. <laughs> there it goes. Yeah. But by looking at the different colors, we can determine, you know, some about the composition, what gas is illuminated, what types of gas are illuminated. Um, so there's a lot of things you can measure with different color filters with a planetary nebula like this one. And uh, one thing we'll notice with this is unlike, for example, the globular clusters, which were very red, uh, the central object at least will be fairly blue um, because it's a very, it, it's the hot, core of the star that evolved so it's a, it's a very hot object that it that will eventually cool off and uh, over the course of the next few thousand years but um as compared to the objects we looked at so far it is uh it'll be on the bluer side um, and again if we uh if we were to combine these images and uh make a nice color plot, you would see that with the, the central object much, much bluer than the surrounding uh, surrounding gas and dust. But here we go, you can start to see in this one, oh, that, there you go. Compact, that compact central object there, um, surrounded by a haze of, of dust. Um, so that is the, the core of the star that has then puffed off its outer layers to, to form this nebula. Um, and, and we can actually see that, uh, that, that, that core that's left behind. Um, and so it's about, um, so it, it, that, that core is about a third the size of our sun. Um, so it's a very, again, astronomically speaking, <laughs> a, a very small compact object um, that is, uh, that's left behind there. And I should have blocked the scale. Let's So while John is playing with image display, um, we have another question. Oh, yep, go ahead. So do that. we use an auto guider with the nickel telescope? Yes, we do. And I haven't mentioned that at all because we've been doing relatively short exposures. Um, but we do have a, uh, a guider. Um, so it's an off-axis guider. Um, it looks at stars in the field, and uh, we can uh, look at the position of a given star over time um, in very, very short exposures, fractions of a second, and it will correct the pointing of the telescope um, as the, um, because, because the tracking of the telescope is not perfect. Um, so um, the, the guider will track the position of a given star. Um, and make very fast uh, corrections to the pointing of the telescope to correct for any drift. Um, and that is something that completely slipped my mind, um, which I should have mentioned earlier. But um, as I said, the, the tracking of the nickel telescope is pretty good. Um, so for relatively short exposures, um, it's uh, not, not something we, we uh, need to worry about a huge amount, but for, for longer exposures, um, it's certainly something that we'd want to use to avoid um, uh, to to uh, to avoid star trailing. Um, but you can see we haven't used it so far, and the the images are pretty good. Um, but that is something that yes, I should have mentioned earlier. Thank you. So so what exposure time would be long enough to require guiding? Uh, so I mean, I rule of thumb would be probably few to five minutes, um, certainly longer than five minutes, I'd want to use guiding. Um, 
had I thought about it, I probably would have used it for the uh, for the three minute galaxy exposures. But um, uh, but uh, yeah, few minute to longer exposures. Um, I should say for some of our fainter objects, for some of the science targets, you know, people will do half hour exposures with uh, with uh, this camera, and that's certainly um, at that point you really need um, the guiding. But um, here you can see um, the difference in the brightness of the object in different filters. So you can see that that central object um, is uh, much, much fainter in the red here, in the infrared um, versus the other filters. Um, but again, any, any other questions that we've had so far? Um, let's see. Sorry, I lost yep. track. <laughs> So many questions have come through. I've got to see if there's any I've missed. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, yes, there's another question. If we have exposures going, or do we want to move to another target? Uh, sure, let's move to another. Let's go um, hit. Um, there were a lot of people, I think, keen on M51. I was going to say that was the runner up, right? <laughs> that was so, the runner up, uh, I think, in the galaxy. So we'll see how much the moon washes it out. So, but. Yeah. Uh, it should be better positioned so yes it should be better positioned that was, again for some reason that just did not enter my mind that the moon exists <laughs> <laughs> checked everything else but... so i do okay. mostly infrared science and one night i was observing a quasar and when you're doing infrared the moonlight doesn't really affect your data um because you're looking so far red but i didn't think to look at where the moon was and it turned out my quasar was actually behind the moon and it was impossible to observe that night. I had to wait hours, or I think I actually observed it the next night because I had the next night. Uh, so um, you do need to think about the moon when, you, you know, but as professional observers, we sometimes forget because we get so focused on other things. <laughs> so, but anyway, there is a, um, a question here from Jeffrey, and this was very early on in the evening. Oh, he said, I'm familiar with RA and DEC. What is HA? So HA is the hour angle. Um, so um, the it, it, it's the um, so so RA is the right ascension, and that will you know as the Earth rotates as we move through the night, the RA that is directly overhead will change. Um, the hour angle is what um, what uh, is is um, kind of a physical pointing of the telescope. So an hour angle of zero is directly overhead. And then as you go to larger hour angles, you move more to the east and to the west. Okay, okay so we are there. So I'm going to turn off the dome light. Go back to the V filter. And since we've mentioned it, let's take a look at the guider. So one of the quirky things about M51 is if you go to the catalog positions, there are no good guide stars yes. for M51. It's, it's sort of a singular it's object in my experience faint, with maybe, but... the nickel. Yeah, so you're, you're going to have to set up maybe a 10 second exposure to get enough counts for a good guiding. So. Yeah, normally with the, the guide camera, as I said, we'd be operating at kind of fractions of a second, um, because however long your exposure time is with the guide camera, that is the limit to how often you update the telescope pointing. Um, so the faster you can do that, the better. Um, but uh, yes, in this case, we have a very sparse field. So let's, let's bump it up and then we'll grab that. Let's start there. Um, so our red box is our sky box. So that will subtract off the counts from the sky from the counts in these boxes here. Um, and the way our guider works is actually relatively simple. Um, you can see we have four boxes here, two green on the sides, two yellow on the top and bottom. 
And so the software will look at the counts in each of those boxes, top, bottom, left, and right, and um, we'll try to balance the counts in each of those boxes because stars are symmetrical. So you would hope that if the telescope is tracking correctly, the brightness in, the, in each of those four boxes should be um, the same over time. And so our guide, I just tries to, um, okay, so we have a decent number of counts. So our guide just tries to uh, move the telescope to keep the counts in each of those four quadrants balanced. Um, so we're in M51, in V. And let's start with a few minutes. And let's see. So M51 is another nice spiral galaxy. Um, this one is face on, so you can actually see the nice um, spiral arms. Um, again, it's relatively bright. So it was discovered back in the 1700s. Um, it's part of the Messier catalog. So Charles Messier, when he was looking for comets, recorded a lot of nebulous objects um, because in the instruments of the time, you, you, couldn't easily discern features of it. You just saw this fuzzy patch of nebulosity on the sky. Um, and uh, so that's why the, the Messier objects contain all sorts of objects like galaxies and nebulae. And, um, but um, uh, yeah, again, it's a spiral galaxy similar to our own. It's again, smaller, um, about what's I think, 60,000 light years across. So again, a little over half the size of our galaxy. Um, but uh, the one of the uh, interesting things that came out about the Whirlpool um, last year is uh, um, they uh, there have been signs of an extra extra galactic planet. Uh, um, an, an exoplanet, um, so uh, th there were detections of a potential planet in uh, the Whirlpool galaxy, um, which if confirmed would be the first planet detected outside our own galaxy. Um, so that was in, I think, September of last year. So a fairly recent um, and exciting result. Um, that I know a lot of my friends in the, in the exoplanet community got uh, pretty interested in. Um, but uh, I like the whirlpool just because it's a very pretty galaxy. <laughs> so, you know, nice face on spiral. Um, it has a small companion. Um, so you get you get to see the, the tidal interaction between the two. Um, you can see the gas and the dust getting pulled around um, from the companion. Um, uh, yeah, a, uh, a, a favorite for, um, for, for pretty pictures is uh, the whirlpool. So you ready for some more questions, uh, John? Yes, by all means. So why is it named the Nickel Telescope? OK, so the Nickel Telescope. Um, so I mentioned uh, that it was built in the 70s after um, uh, we had some money uh, bequeathed to us um, by a San Jose seamstress named Anna Nickel. Um, so because she gave the money to construct the telescope, um, and the telescope was uh, was named after her. Um. Excellent. Um, how do astronomers get time on the telescope? So unsurprisingly, um, <laughs> it is a competitive process um, because uh, given the opportunity, I think any astronomer would just take all the time they can get and uh, and run with it. Um, so uh, the telescopes we have here are in general available to members of the UC, the University of California system, and there is the Whirlpool. Um, so again, let's change up another filter and off we go. Um, so it's open to members of the UC, um, and they actually um, 
anyone who wants to use to get time on our telescopes has to write a proposal, basically laying out what science they want to do, what observations they need to do that science, why it's important and interesting. Um, that all gets submitted um, a couple of times a year. We have two um, semesters. Um, people will apply for time in a given semester. Um, and those are, um, those are looked at and um, awarded time um, based on how competitive and interesting the research is. Um, depending on the size of the telescope, that can be a little more um, competitive than others. So um, the nickel, for example, generally has quite a lot of time available. It's a smaller telescope. There are fewer projects that can be done with it. Um, but we still fill a majority of the time, even on the nickel. And then on the Shane, time is much more um, competitive. And then if you go to like the larger, even larger telescopes, so things like Keck in Hawaii, um, again, it's kind of multiplied and you get many, many more proposals and much more competitive for time. Um, but it's a similar process um, everywhere. Can you point out some interesting features of the Whirlpool with your uh, cursor? Absolutely. So, um, so we have the, the um, central bulge of the um, Whirlpool galaxy. You can see the spiral arms um, coming around here. Um, you, can see, you may be able to see a few of them um, with some dust lanes in between. And then um, hopefully we'll be able to see, um, so it should be up here, the um, smaller companion. Um, so it's about a third of the size. Um, we'll see a, um, a bridge of, of dusty material between the two, um, two objects as they actually interact um, with each other. Um, but you can see the, uh, the spiral arms here and then the, the darker, dustier material in between. Um, so the, the core, um, this, this very bright core here, um, it's very, very dense. It has many of the older stars. Um, again, it will be kind of on the redder side and the, the spiral arms out here will be more blue. That's where all of the younger stars are. That's where the young stars are actually born from the, um, from the gas and dust there. Um, that's where the new stars form. Um, one thing we can't see here um, because we are looking in visible light is in the very center of the galaxy here um, is actually a very strong um, X-ray source. Um, and so there, there's something in the center there that is emitting a lot of X-ray um, X ray radiation. And um, so um, that we see in many galaxies um, and that is a uh, massive black hole at the uh, center of the, of, of the galaxies. Um, so the sombrero that we looked at earlier has one. Um, the whirlpool has another um, uh, black hole at the center. Um, and we have a question from Dawn. How far away is the whirlpool? Uh, so the whirlpool is uh, 30 million light years away. Um, so it's, uh, again, when we're dealing with galaxies, we are, you know, we're talking millions of light years. Um, within our own galaxy, we're talking hundreds of thousands to thousands of light years. So it's uh, kind of another step beyond that. So uh, 30, 30 million light years. So we're looking at the, the light from this object, you know, as it was um, 30 million years ago, which is uh, always a fun thing to think of. And excellent. So if there are any last questions, people should type them into the chat because we will be wrapping it up here in just a few minutes uh, once we get these last exposures the on the world. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Um, but yeah, as I said, the, the whirlpool is a, is a small galaxy compared to our own. Um, it's about half the, half the size um, in physical size. It's about 60,000 light years across versus 100-ish for our own. Um, and then it's, um, again, less massive than, uh, than our galaxy. Um, uh, I think, what is our galaxies? Um, 
something like one and a half trillion solar masses. So, so um, our galaxy as a, as a whole is about um, one and a half, ha has uh, a mass of about one and a half trillion times that of our sun. Um, the whirlpool is, I think, 600 billion times the mass of our sun. So about a third the mass of the Milky Way. Um, so it's a, it's a physically smaller and a much less massive um, galaxy than our, than our own. Um, albeit still a spiral. So uh, even within the same kind of classification of galaxies, you still have a wide range of, uh, of morphologies. So Naf asks in the chat, is there any kind of post-processing done to the images slash data collected? So for science purposes, um, it will depend what we wanted to do. Um, so for example, a lot of um, the work I did um, involved um, photometry. So that was making precise measurements of the brightnesses of individual stars. And so to do that, we would um, take our calibration, so the flat fields that we took earlier, um, as well as bias frames that account for the, um, the bias voltage on our detector. Um, and um, then we, would, we had um, various pieces of software with which we would go in and make um, precise uh, measurements of the brightnesses of individual objects. Um, if we were doing things like spectroscopy, where instead of taking images, uh, we would split the light from stars or galaxies or whatever object we were looking at into its component wavelengths, um, you, we would do things like um, apply wavelength solutions to correspond um, pixels to uh, wavelength. Um, and then, um, you know, if we just wanted to make fun, pretty pictures. Um, that's a whole other subset of playing around with how you combine the different filters and what color channels you use and how you scale the individual um, images. Um, so I think the, the short answer is it depends what you're doing with the, with the data, with the images. Um, but there, there is certainly always, there, there are always more steps beyond just you know, taking the data. Um, that is usually the beginning of the process rather than uh, rather than uh, the the end. There's certainly a lot, lot more that goes on um, once you have the data in hand. Um, getting the images is the, uh, the fun and easy part. <laughs> so John, now that we've started this exposure, maybe if you could stop sharing your screen for the moment, I would like I to mean. share my screen for just By a second. Means. So speaking of image processing, that we have you know, images in each of the color filters. I hope you can see my screen and see some images I have made from the Nickel Telescope as color images. Um, so that you can see that with enough data, um, NAF quipped about taking 10 more exposures and stacking them. Indeed, to make color images like this, I do tend to take multiple exposures, much longer exposures, stack them, assign colors. It's, it's quite a process to come up with images that are scientifically informative, depending on what colors you assign different filters, um, aesthetically pleasing, um, you know, all those things. But it's, as I said, I just wanted to show you, you know, partly just a little self brag because I made these pictures and I think they're beautiful, but that, you know, that you know, astronomy is, of course, probably why we all got interested in it was it's, you know, the objects are gorgeous and scientifically interesting. Uh, so I'll stop sharing so that John can go back to his screen. Um, but those are on those images I took are on the web. So if you want to look at them at your leisure, um, you're welcome to. But as I said, the, each one of those images had, you know, a couple hours of work of doing the regular data processing we would for a scientific image and then combining them into the beautiful pictures. Excellent. Ah. Okay. 
And uh, yeah. S. Green asks, mm -hmm. what stacking software do I use? Um, I write my own software, so I do it all in a, you know, well, nowadays Python, but uh, in old days, uh, interactive data language or IDL, because um, uh, I like knowing exactly what's happening on each step so that I, I write my own code. <laughs> and uh, yeah, similarly with all of the um, cluster data we used to take, we had our own pipeline in Fortran, an old programming language. Um, although we never made stacked images for um, stack color images, we would stack images for very deep uh, photometry. And so we do the same thing, stack many, many exposures to get as deep and as faint as, uh, as we could. Um, and that's uh, typical of, of astronomy. Everyone usually has their own tool of choice that you know has been written years ago and has been used for forever. Um, but it all tends to be fairly custom and excellent. So our final image is reading out now. And there we have the whirlpool again. Um, but you can see the the core is is much fainter. Um, in this image because we're in the blue um, versus in the red and the infrared where again those older stars much much brighter. Um, okay. okay so I think at this point uh, let's thank John for keeping us entertained for two solid hours um, uh, and well, I'm really quickly. impressed with how many of you stuck it out for a little late to see the whirlpool and to stay with us uh, longer than our planned program. Um, we very much enjoyed having you uh, join us this evening, um, and, and we will hope to do this again in the future since the, everyone seems to be having very uh, positive reactions. Um, so again, uh, you know, thank you for supporting us as friends of Lick Observatory. Uh, it's, you know, it's been a tough year for everyone, but with the um, SCU fire and other things, it was a little more challenging than it might otherwise have been here at Lick Observatory. And, the um, support we get from Polo, uh, our friends of Lick Observatory, really does help. And so we very much appreciate uh, everything. So uh, thank you and uh, have a good night. <laughs>